say welcome, and uh, we've been looking forward to putting on this program, and I can see that there's a lot of people that are interested, so uh, we're pleased to have you and, and good to go. Who doesn't care about Warner Circle and Warner Mansion? Um, you know, it's one of the integral parts of town, and a lot of energy, effort, dedication, and tenacity has gone into getting us where we are today, and our panel is going to Give us a refresher on the history of the mansion. Uh, Steve Cohen, longtime KHS officer and board member, uh, is going to review our history. You know, if back in the day we would have said Brainerd Water was a game changer, right? So when he decided to park his summer place here in Kensington, it kind of changed the dynamics of the town forever. Then we've got uh, Jason Gerson, who is a cornerstone of the Friends of Warner Circle. Um, between those two organizations, we had a lot of individuals and, you know, KHS as a historic society, and the Friends of Warner Circle as a coalition of interested persons advocating for the best for the Warner Circle property in the mansion. You know, it's, it's interesting in historic preservation. You know, we forget that this is a neighbor this mansion and this circle is a neighbor to the people who live there. It's across the street, down the street, around the corner. So a lot of people care about it greatly for that reason. Uh, Brenda Sandberg is here from the county parks. And I was fun talking to her before we got started because she's got a way of illustrating the timeline that I think you'll find interesting from the beginning days to now and how she marked that timeline. She's worked a lot in parks and open space, a legacy open space, and is, interestingly, I thought, an aquatic ecologist. So I like that. Who doesn't know Carl? If not in person, you know his name. He's uh, been working on this for quite some time. And you know he's known in the preservation community, as much of you probably know, for the work on the seminary uh, buildings and converting that to condominium and residential usage. So his forte is preservation, renovation, and adaptive reuse, using the sneaking that term for Brenda, of historic property. So he's going to talk to us about what it's going to take to get that property not only restored, but established for the future. You know, make it efficient and whatever future. Interesting factoid, two things actually. He uh, teaches at Georgetown and he's a vintner. So I see that we've got our beer situation resolved with Baby Cat, that we need to work on, you know, some relationship with the, uh, you know, property. Anyway, um, I'm going to let Steve start the presentation and. I will sit down and take it away. Can everybody hear me back there? All right, good, 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 good. So I'm Steve Cohen, and uh, I've lived in Kensington with my wife, Colleen, for over 30 years, and we live in a 125-year-old house. And Carl, we'd like to talk to you later. Uh, no, but- um, let, let me finish this first. All right. One of the interesting things about our house is we, we're actually the third owners of the house in 125 years. So. Anyway, uh, there's one little thing I put in the presentation. There is a false statement, a false fact in the um, presentation, and anybody who picks it up will get a prize at the end of the presentation. Nobody's interested. Okay. Uh, so I'll start at the beginning, and it all starts with uh, this man, Brainerd Warner. Uh, he was a successful businessman, developer, influential uh, Washingtonian. And um, he was also a wannabe congressman. But uh, one of the things you might be interested to know is why the name Brainerd, where does that come from? So I hunted it down, because I'd never heard that name before. It turns out it means Courageous Raven. So anyway, our Courageous Raven had an idea. Uh, no doubt it was to make some money with a good investment, but he also had a vision. And um, the vision starts here at this dirt road which we believe to be as Knowles somewhere in the 1890s, but we're not really sure. But that's probably typical what the area looked like. I've been told Connecticut Avenue was like a one-lane dirt road. Um, anyway, the, uh, 
the next slide. This was the manifestation of his vision. Now, many of you have seen the early map of Kensington, but for the heck of it, I pull one in. This is 1944. This is the county map. So you could see how the town has grown since then. But I encourage you to go up to the map room and look at some of the early maps. They're, they're quite interesting. But this was his vision, and he was impressed by what he saw in Kensington, England. And he brought the name to the town and uh, also the general model for the town. Uh, and we all have heard um, um, the idea that it's a garden community uh, with uh, wide spaces, curvilinear streets. I think we have uh, Helen to thank for the word curvilinear streets. I never heard of that before, but I like it. Um, so I, uh, he, uh, he, he brought his family. Um, to the, to the, the uh, manor in uh, 1892. And one of the really interesting things is that it was really a focal point for socialization. He had parties there, visits by dignitaries and um, national figures. I think probably part of the process of running for Congress, which he was unsuccessful at, and uh, included uh, President Taft in one of his parties. And uh, it says it's like the largest party that ever happened in Montgomery County. So I think, I don't know, either Montgomery County was very small or it was a really big party. Um, but I think one of the things I'd like to think, I'd like to believe, is that if, if, if the ghost of Warner emerged um, today, he'd be really pleased. I think he'd see his, you know, his vision of a garden community realized. I, I think it's really a wonderful thing to think of all these years that it sort of kind of maintained the continuity of what Kensington's all about. Um, so, let's see, uh, slide four? Ah, good. So the manor, carriage house, and uh, surrounding property, although they've been modified many, many times over the years, it's pretty much as it stands today. Um, and uh, slide five? Uh, and now it's an iconic landmark. Um, and uh, it, what draws it to us is the historic nature of the property, but the green space uh, and uh, the community activities. Uh, now, it's also my thought that if he emerged in the 1970s, he might not have been so pleased. Uh, the, uh, back then, there was a real lack of appreciation for the town's heritage, its historic roots, uh, historic homes were being raised, um, the, uh, and there was really not much thought to what these contributed to the town's value and its, uh, its uh, character. The uh, residents uh, started to take notice of this, and in 1977, the Kensington Historical Society was founded. Next slide, very good. As it was in its inception, as it is today, it's an educational organization. Uh, the, uh, it is non-political, uh, both by charter and the general character of the, of the society, and that's probably a good thing. The, um, it, uh, uh, it has no role whatsoever in design approvals. If you think your uh, construction permit to modify your house is going to be held up by the Kensington Historical Society, please see me. I'll need about $50. <laughs> So, anyway, uh, the, so as we moved on, um, things was, you know, started to get knowledge that the uh, Warner would be changing hands. And uh, folks started thinking about what might happen. With the knowledge that it was going to change hands, uh, uh, slide seven, please. Uh, Many of the members, including KHS members, uh, were concerned about possible outcomes, including loss of the historic character of the buildings, the loss of the green space, and the potential impact on the community. What emerged was a very, very loosely organized organization. It was ad hoc, volunteer community that came to be known as Citizens United to Save the Circle. Uh, we, had an we had never had an organization chart. We never had offices. We never had clearly stated objectives. Um, slide eight, please. Uh, what we did have was lawn signs and a lot of ideas. The uh, unifying focus was to preserve the historic 
uh, exterior of the building and the entire surrounding green space. Our outreach to the community, government, officials, state and county took various forms, including many letters, face, many, many face-to-face -face meetings, and a very successful uh, petition drive. Uh, I'd like to give my thanks to a KHS member and a dear friend, John Doherty. Uh, his dedication and determination to lead an extremely successful community petition uh, it was just, just fabulous effort. Unfortunately, John's no longer with us, but I wanted uh, folks who remember him to think about that. So one of the uh, things we did as part of the outreach, probably the most productive thing we did, uh, was create 10 principles. Uh, and this is, uh, go back, go back. Back one slide. So this is the preamble. You won't be, you won't have to read it. You're not gonna be tested on it. Um, but I wanted to point out that it's the product of the Kensington Historical Society, Citizens United, and the Kensington Land Trust. And we have uh, Helen Wilkes to thank for her contribution to that. So thank you, Helen. Um, this is, these documents are available online. Uh, you can, I can make them available. The, the 10 principles, but I wanted to show you that it was thoughtful and that there was a lot of detail put in it. Uh, and I'll point out that the first one was education. Uh, but also there are other features in it that are important. It's the last one, it's about governance. It's about being able to uh, uh, watch what's going over, you know, uh, have some sort of oversight um, over the uh, use of the uh, property and the maintenance. So if I asked everybody for an idea here and say there were 100 people here, I would have 200 ideas on what to do with the circle. Uh, everybody had an idea. And um, it was hard to kind of distill them all down, at least Citizens United to do that. But I want to thank Park and Planning uh, for the exceptional work they did uh, with community outreach to collect the ideas, to document them, and assess uh, various ideas. And those are very carefully documented and analyzed. It was a very impressive work. Um, they also sponsored a, uh, 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 a separate reuse study by the Urban Land Institute, which uh, had a different uh, uh, view from it because these were professionals that were looking at the problem as opposed to uh, just us citizens, our residents. Now, um, many of you may have heard the term demolition by neglect. Right? It's kind of a scary thought, and it's when somebody really wants to tear down a building, but they can't. Well, park and planning is the exact opposite, and I have nothing but high praise for what they did from the entire start of this project. Um, they um, restored and continued to preserve the building and the surrounding grounds, and anybody that was an observer of the last 20 years <laughs> might remember the nursing home extension. Anybody remember it? All right. Okay, well, they took the cinder block building and they turned it into cinders. Uh, they removed this massive uh, fuel tank from under the building. If you didn't believe in aliens and you saw this fuel tank, you may have thought that aliens had visited us because this thing was so big. Um, they restored the porches with a fabulous job, windows, roofs, and they returned the building to its original colors. But they did many, many other things. And um, I, I just uh, am very pleased with Park. Uh, we had a very close relationship uh, with uh, Julie Mueller and uh, Joey Lampy, who are long retired, but their legacy lives on. And Brenda, I'm glad to see you at the helm because we have excellent stewards there. And your taxes, your taxes are being well spent. So as I mentioned, go to slide line, there's no shortage of uh, ideas. Uh, and if I turn your attention to the one, two, three, four, fifth one down, subdivided lots and building lots, that was probably the most frightening prospect because that would have divided up all the green space into houses. The fiscal managers in the county love that, okay? And that concerned us because that created sort of a opposing force on how to use the property. If you just look at it from econo an economic standpoint, and how do you uh, monetize the value of historic structure. 
And I think that could be done, but we're not used to doing that in terms of the real value. Um, so when you look at all these things, you have to ask yourself one question. It's about the cost. If you have a business, what's the cost of the interior renovations? What's the cost of the maintenance? And it's huge. And it, uh, it's a key business expense. And it's probably most important to the county because, one, the business has got to incur all those costs up front. That's a huge burden. I think Carl will speak to that. Um, and the county insisted that the property be self-sustaining. In other words, don't rely on any county or government funds to keep this thing going. Um, so the first outreach step was the, not the first one, but really the most visible outreach step was park and planning released a request for proposal for adaptive uses. And they did receive responses. Oh, and we were very, very pleased that they included the 10 principles as a reference in their RFP. So that we thought was really a big success. Um, but I think the uh, responses to the RFP were sort of non-responsive because there were leasing requirements. So whatever business came in there was subject to a limited lease. And that made the financial equation even more complicated. So. Anyway, um, but subsequently and very fortunately, uh, Washington Landmark's proposal for conversion to condominiums was accepted. And I understand that the, uh, the ink is dry on the contract. And I'm very pleased to do that because I couldn't imagine a better outcome for the town and the residents. Um, so after the arc of this talk, you know, uh, f watching this thing for, I don't know, somebody asked me how many years we've been, we've been involved in this, and I didn't know. But it's long, and we're at the end point here, or we're at a juncture, and uh, it's the right place to be. So I'm, I'm really pleased. It's an exciting time, although it doesn't seem like a very exciting subject. But so anyway, uh, so now, and you'll hear all about this from Carl, but now I'd like to interest Jason Gerson, who will, not done yet, <laughs> who will talk about Friends of the Circle, a much, much more organized effort <laughs> than Citizens United, and they're really now at the forefront of uh, community advocacy. So, Jason, it's all yours. Thank you, Steve. All right. Um, I will keep this brief. I see we're running a little behind, and Carl has a lot oh, to say. For yeah, me. sure. So, oh, it's okay. I, I'm, okay. Um, all right, so as Steve said, I'm Jason Gerson, I'm chair of the board for the Friends of Warner Circle. Um, I have been since its creation, formal creation in 2018. I've been a Kensington resident since 2013 with my family, so um, not as long standing as Steve. And I, I think I, I'm going to keep this brief. A lot of um, what I was going to say, uh, Steve has addressed thematically. And I think for Friends of Warner Circle, we kind of picked up the mantle that Save the Circle um, had um, very um, heroically started uh, long before I was a town resident. And um, yeah, I think, you know, around 2017, there were a group of us who, you know, were um, really beginning to take notice of the demolition uh, by neglect that Steve has. Um, mentioned uh, for the buildings. At this point, we were the beneficiaries of Save the Circles and others' activism, so we were really focused on the building structures. We didn't really have to worry about the parkland that surrounded them, but we were very concerned. Many of us had kids who were still like wanting to play around the circle and um, seeing that you know, there was something, there was an opportunity there to be, to be um, explored in terms of re-engaging the park, re-engaging the town um, about Trying to end. So, Friends of Warner Circle, as it became known, was essentially uh, created to be a catalyst, uh, a voice for community residents, a catalyst to work with parks, to work with the town, and to work with prospective um, folks who were interested in coming and making something of the buildings. And, you know, I think we engaged, there was, you know, and Steve was involved in those early days too, and we had other members, John, uh, John as well, as, and many others who had that historical memory. And I think we, learned from them. We also realized, you know, we were kind of, uh, you know, happy to tread on the same ground with a kind of a new uh, vision that was more focused on the buildings rather than having to 
preserve the, the entire parkland. And I really want to echo Steve and um, you know, just say at this juncture that Parks was, has been a great partner for us. All, um, all the folks we work with who are engaged and really quite passionate about the Warner Circle Park and the buildings and doing and identifying um, you know, a partner who would come and do a historic preservation job. And I think, you know, for us, for Friends of Warner Circle, we had two main, we had a number of main purposes. One is to keep the community educated, because even though, like, the, before the pandemic, we were all very busy with our lives, and although the circle's in, our, in the center, like, it be, kind of became part of the landscape, and where we didn't really, perhaps, fully realize what we had there. And I think, uh, at least for me and my family, the pandemic brought into clear relief, like, the the vital benefit you know, of, of having the park there to activate the park to keep it used um, in many respects. And so we, uh, you know, endeavored from, you know, that 2017 through the pandemic to really uh, ensure that there was park activation to educate the community about, you know, what opportunities and developments were happening and working with parks to really, um, you know, promote its use. And so you'll see, um, you know, on, on a subsequent slide, we can stay on this one for now, um, that we, you know, expended a lot of effort to really make the park something special for the community in a way that perhaps it had been underutilized in the past. And like, like Save the Circle, we kind of arrived at a set of, like through our mission and a set of principles somewhat pared down, but it was really, it was really focused on, you know, ensuring that the buildings were, whatever happened with them, there would be, the character would be historically preserved, I think. You know, as Steve noted, there were many kind of other constraints around financial viability to find something that was sustainable for the long term and viable, um, and not something that we would need to revisit over time and have be a source of concern, that financial stability would be in place. Um, and again, you know, part of it was saying like, let's make sure that all the features of Warner Circle Park that we prize and value are whatever becomes of the buildings is um, preserved and that it can still be used for all the you know, myriad activities, dog walking, just just hanging out and picnicking, the the story walks, I think all of that could be preserved, music like in concerts. And so, um, you know, we spent a fair bit of time trying to, um, you know, identify, I think it was in the same day as in the early days of say the circle, trying to identify some early uses and realizing that the cost of preser doing that historic preservation work properly were gonna be prohibitive for most kind of nonprofit uses and trying to attract um, a partner there was was challenging but we did spend a fair bit of time in our early days like thinking through options and um, talking to community members like yourselves that are here tonight about about it and I think there's a fair bit of you know serendipity that um, you know that Carl and his team brought and arrived with you know having that having the um, you know, the reputation and the track record for doing historic preservation and coming up with the seed of an idea. This is going back, what, to 2019? Oh, now boy. it feels like, yeah, um, many moons ago um, when he first came to the town um, in this room, I think, um, to uh, kind of present some of the ideas. And I, you know, I think for, from where I sit, you know, Friends of Warner Circle is really, um, remains vital in a sense that, you know, as the kind of relationship between parks and the county and Carl, has solidified, you know, there's a number of us that have stayed engaged with Carl as the plans have formed and attended the public meetings and really tried to be a voice um, for the community residents to ensure that what does get built um, is, you know, is not only just nice to look at aesthetically, but that is like something that we can be proud of and that's something that really, as we're spending time in the park, that we're happy, you know, to see it here, happy to have more town residents join Kensington, um, Although there may be some that will just leave their homes and uh, move into cross condos, from what I've heard. Um, so good for you. And um, and yeah, and it really just like I I, don't, I think even with a contract signed, as you alluded to, Steve, that uh, the friends work will continue. I think you know we're still at the very early phases of um, at the work that Carl's team will do, and we'll stay engaged with them. Um, and be a li liaison to the community, and you know, I think he knows, and Parks knows that we're we're still here to be an important voice for the for the town residents, and we work closely with Mayor Tracy and the council too, and um, 
ensuring that that happens and happens, you know, in a timely way and happens that we that we stay involved and on top of things. So, I think that in the interest of time, I'll stop there. And I'm happy to take questions um, later, but I'll pass it along. So, thank you. Oh. Well, I will say one more thing since Catherine did go to the trouble of doing all these slides. So let me go to the next, next slide. Yeah, sorry, I was interested in. Uh, it's frozen. It's frozen. So I will just speak to it and say, for those of you in the town and have enjoyed all the park activation activities, Opera and Circle, Chamber Music in the Circle, having the park set up a bike track and skate track, um, among, among other events, um, we want to continue doing that um, in one form or another, and that's our, that's one of our aspirations. I, they were they've been very warm community events that I think people enjoy partaking of, and so um, that will be part of Friends of Warner Circles continuing mission. Okay, really fast. Okay, really fast. This, uh, everything I everything I said is true. We have pictures, and now it's gone. So um, there you have it. It's all available on Catherine's laptop, so you can come look, you can come look later. Um, you can have them. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, is this one on? It is? All right. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you for the very kind words about the Parks Department work in it. Um, as I was introduced, I'm Brenda Sandberg. I am currently the um, real estate management supervisor in Montgomery Parks. Um, but back when Parks Roll was initiated, and hopefully we'll get my PowerPoints up pretty quickly, um, I, uh, I, was the, um, I was the manager of the Legacy Open Space program. Legacy Open Space was a functional master plan, so it sort of covered all of the county, and the goal was to try and, try and preserve the best remaining open spaces in Montgomery County. I think around 1998, 1999, the demographic projections were that finally showing that within 10 to 20 years, Montgomery County's population was going to break a million. I think a lot of elected leaders and folks were like, wow, that's a lot of people and we're gonna, only gonna keep growing. We need to make sure the open spaces we need of all different kinds, whether natural, urban, or historic are open and, and preserved to serve not just today's residents, but the future. Um, I always tried to think of my timeline as 100 years from now. 100 years from now, what are we gonna wish we had saved? as a public space that the public can take advantage of. Um, so we can go on. So um, I'll just try and do this very quickly. And this is just basically the, 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 the story from, from 2001, when Legacy Open Space Master Plan was adopted, through where we are today. This is sort of the before and after, just when we did the, the paint job. You can see it over there and how the, the um, the, the porches were all screened off and, and there were trees that had been growing into the building which was damaging it. And this is a photo not long after our first phase of rehab. So next slide. So again, I already mentioned Legacy Open Space Functional Master Plan and this site was identified as a, an important um, cultural resource that was potentially at risk. And it was because his house was built on 18 of the original lots. And those lots were technically buildable. They were grandfathered in under the zoning codes. So theoretically, probably the front wouldn't have been built, but you could have had a whole bunch of houses built on the back half behind all those buildings. Um, and that would have made a pretty big impact on, on this. Um, 2005, 2006, a few years later, after some negotiations with first the owners who had owned it for about 50 years and run the nursing home and then with a development group that had purchased it from them, um, we succeeded in convincing the, um, the planning board to, to acquire it. We used county bonds, which is why the property is titled to the community at this point. There were three main reasons that you know, was our, our sales pitch for why it was important to preserve this site. First was the historic preservation, the structures, the link to Brainerd Warner and his history of development in the whole DC area, as well as Kensington itself. Open space preservation. Ever since it was a nursing home, that open space really served as a quasi-public park that the community could go take walks on and, and play on. Even though it wasn't officially public, a lot of public events occurred and a lot of casual use of the open space um, happened. And in addition, come up with an adaptive reuse for the buildings. What can we use 
at about 11,000 square feet within this historic building force. So those are the things we looked at. Um, as Steve already mentioned, in 2008, we issued an RFP to try and find an adapter for use. Was there a partner out there who had the money to try and fix it up and reuse it? Um, unfortunately, um, it was, it was not just sort of a money thing, but really the only two applications we received were for private schools who wanted to keep the nursing home wing <laughs> and use that as a school building. And that was one of the key things is that we did not want to keep the nursing home wing. We wanted to try and restore the site to its original arrangement. Um, we were directed by the planning board to start work um, to find a public use since we couldn't find a private use at that time. So next slide. There we are. So when we first purchased it in 2005 to 2017, uh, we, it's 1.7 million was in the information I saw, but it's, um, I, I think it's well above that, that Park spent. And that was a combination of some state bond money, um, Parks Department funds, funds from the Legacy Open Space Program itself. Um, one of the key things we did was change the color scheme to the historic. Um, this is one of our facilities management um, supervisors who was pointing to the location where he had taken a paint chip and I took photos of every place he took a paint chip so when we sent them all off to the uh, company that would analyze the paint we knew exactly which location and it turns out it was a three color paint scheme if people haven't noticed there's the sort of creamy color of the building there's the brown for the um, trim and the ceiling of that of all the um, porches was a very pale sky blue. And if you don't really look up when you're standing on that porch, you won't notice that. Um, again, the nursing home wing demolition, that was one of the biggest projects. Um, and uh, I think we can see our friend Helen Wilkes here <laughs> on the left of this picture when I was doing a, a tour of the demolition site in process. Um, that's not the best picture there, but it shows the top of the roof of some of the, and how the back of the building was nowhere, was totally obliterated by the new construction, um, by the nursing home. And then at further phases, uh, we not only blocked it off, but totally restored the rear terrace, the kitchen um, porch on the side, and then the loop driveway. And then the next slide. And then this is just a, a, also a little bit of a before and after. Um, you can see this is what the property looked like with and, and how massive the nursing home wing was, um, as well as a big um, addition adjacent to the, the L that um, is sort of on the bottom of that slide. And then this is a current aerial photo from 2023 showing what it looks like. You can see that the, um, tried to make it somewhat the same angle. The nursing home is completely gone and the loop circle has been um, rebuilt, which is how it originally was. There was a, a circle around there. All right, so next slide. So back to the timeline. So 2009 to 2011, um, we, we, um, we hired an architectural firm to do a facility plan, which is what we call doing a design plan up to about 30, 35%. Um, that was a proposal for putting um, part, some parks department offices and an archeology span lab and some community um, meeting spaces into the building. Um, the planning board approved it in 2011, uh, but it never worked out for there to be county funding um, um, or parks funding to fully fund that. Um, after that did not move forward um, in 2017, as Steve mentioned, there was a charrette done by the Urban Land Institute, which identified three feasible options for what you could, the most feasible options for what you could do with these structured housing, low impact office, or multicultural arts. Um, I've underlined housing because that's the only one that's financially self-sustaining, where it wouldn't require public tax dollars to support the ongoing use within the structures. Um, only a year after that, we heard from Carl and the Washington Landmark Construction, and the discussions were started with him and with the community. Um, uh, in 2019, a letter of intent was signed, a non-bending agreement to move forward, and at, within the last week or two, we finally have a fully executed contract for the sale of the buildings only, not the entire property. If you can go to the next slide. 
And just a real quick summary. So the two buildings and support areas in sort of a three-dimensional box, think of it that way, it's a cube, but it won't be as neat and tidy as a cube, but sort of a three-dimensional box is what will be sold as a condominium unit to Carl's organization. The rest of the property, including underneath the, the historic and the, the new, con and, and anything that happens at the condo, is still going to remain um, titled to Montgomery County, but as a public park managed by the commission. Um, so Warner Circle Park will be open to the public for everyday park use and the special events that others have mentioned that it's really um, uh, known for. I didn't finish that section on the side, but portions of the residential condo unit we have in the agreements will be available for special events a certain number of times of year so that the special events that rely on using that lovely um, um, rear terrace as a, a, as a stage for pumpkin rock and roll, for opera in the park, for a lot of other special events. Um, there's, we, there's a deal where those events will still get to happen and, and there'll be public access to those parts of it for certain events at certain times during the year to be worked out. Uh, um, next slide. And here's just some photos of some of the examples of some of the events. Um, I mean, I think that was some special Kensington bike ride. I don't know the exact title of it, where people ended up there and took a great photo. I believe the photo on the right is from the Pumpkin Rock and Roll. Um, and then we can go on to the next. Okay, so here's my time scale. This is the time scale through which I measure this event. <laughs> we bought the first half of the property in 2005, the second half in 2006. Between those two dates, I had twins. And that is me with my twins when they were only about two, three, four months old in the kitchen of the, uh, of, of the nursing home. Um, and I tell you, it was a mess, and that was a really hot day. <laughs> it was, and, and I just, I was still on maternity leave. I had to come in and do that. Today, my kids are applying to college and they're 18 oh. years old. So that is my timeline for when this started and where we are now. So I, again, I have to give thanks um, real quick to a shout out to Julie Mueller, Joey Lample, retired members of the cultural resources staff at Parks. Um, Samantha Schron is the, is the architecture supervisor within the park development division. That's the division that I'm in now um, as the real estate manager. And she's the one sort of leading all the work on the detailed permits. Um, there's not only building permits, but a park construction permit that has to go forward. Um, she cannot be here tonight, but I'm sure she will be at meetings with the, the active citizens and other folks. So I'm, I'm thrilled to see this moving forward. Thank you so much. And I'll hand it over to Carl, who's the star of the show yeah, tonight. Thank you. And let's get started. I mean, it's a, a, a pure pleasure to, to uh, be here. I'm Carl Vogelmeyer, and I've been uh, working on this project for unbelievably so six years. <laughs> And, um, you know, only recently have we got all the details down and, um, you know, we've been moving forward with the team. And, I, you know, I want to say, uh, you know, thank you very much to Parks for working with us so closely. Arguably, this is one of the more complicated <coughs> projects you've ever seen in your life. Uh, you have, um, you know, multiple lots that were mentioned that have been consolidated. You've had um, multiple drill rigs out there to determine how quickly and easily the water can be uh, taken over uh, back, uh, the stormwater management system. The loop road, for instance, needs to be changed, unfortunately, slightly to uh, facilitate um, emergency <coughs> vehicles coming and going. Um, and there are slides, I think, that we can start going through. Um, this is the contents. And this is also out in the hallway if you want to read up more on it. But we're trying to develop this project so it lasts for at minimum 50 years, in all probability 100 years. I mean, we're <clears throat> not exactly building scientists, but we use building science to make sure that the building is usable for the uh, residents, that it is comfortable for the residents, that it is ventilated correctly. Um, we're trying to bring in this century and, and bring all of the um, intelligent ideas on how to build uh, and bring it into this particular building. Um, 
there will be 15 residents and uh, there's been a, a crazy outpour of uh, people that are interested already in purchasing and um, we have uh, eight reservation agreements already uh, in place. We've had multiple permits already. Um, uh, the site uh, digging that we mentioned, the archeological digs that we've done, um, and now we are um, in the process of uh, almost starting, and the starting will be the removal of all the hazardous waste. And the hazardous waste includes uh, pretty much all the plaster, which is, which is lead. There's a little bit of asbestos left behind, but it's gonna take a while to get all of that out of there. Um, the building on the exterior, as you see it today, in essence, will be what you'll see tomorrow, with few exceptions. Um, there will be advanced uh, windows put in that are insulated. We do need to maintain a 2020 um, building code, so that will mean that the interior space will be much more modern, um, thicker walls to uh, capture the insulation. And also, for the people that will be living there, you know, we have to be very careful about them and like, you know, their emotional state if you're living on top of someone and hearing footprints and so forth. And, and, and you know, that's not what we want. You know, we're separating the space uh, safely and also um, through um, noise control. Um, some of the specifics are, uh, and I'm a detail guy as you, would have to imagine if you're building something like this. Um, we, it's a 12,748 square foot manor house. Uh, we're building a 5,000 square foot addition. In that addition, there will be a, a, a elevator that will bring um, the residents up to the main floors. And this is a win-win for uh, us uh, as a community. And also the fact that it's um, going to be preserved and the park will be allowed uh, you know, to, to, to function uh, dawn to dusk um, as it currently is. And the um, fact is that um, the, um, the, the, the 16 times a year that the public can use the stone terrace, um, I'm sure that will be uh, you know, utilized. And then the lobby on the interior, which is a museum grade quality um, lobby uh, will be a um, homage, if you will, to uh, Reynard Warner and his family in the town of Kensington. And we're gonna be working with uh, Tracy and um, the art collection and so forth to determine you know, what can be put in there. But it also will have furnishings and such that it will be period or close to period. And that will be of the highest quality uh, restoration um, that one can perform in that particular space. And again, that will be open to the public as well. We're putting a bathroom in the lower level um, and um, you know, for the community to use when they're uh, having uh, an event at, at the space. Um, there will be ADA compliancy, uh, ability to get into the building via uh, a wheelchair. Um, and um, there also is a fitness center for the residents uh, that is part of the carriage house. Um, you know, we, we are Washington Landmark Construction. I've been doing this for 30 years. I mean, you know, no one likes me to say this, but you know, I, I don't wanna get sued by building it wrong, right? So we're gonna build it right. And if we make a mistake, we're gonna admit to our mistake and we're gonna fix it. And you know, there will be a warranty uh, that comes with any new construction of one year, three years, five years. The five years is the structural, the three years is the mechanical, and the one year is the, the paint. Um, and the fact is, you know, we will be there for five years. I've already said that I will be managing the space for five years. And, you know, any of the bugs or problems that happen when you build something new will be easily and uh, quickly taken care of. Um, it's an incredible collaboration. I mean, Parks has been phenomenal the county is, is helped out. We, we've uncovered so many things. The consolidation of the, of the lots, the 17 lots that now uh, is currently one and it needs to be turned into two. Um, and the two essentially is the second box, but it's really a circle that runs around the mansion. 
Um, there will be parking uh, for the residents. There also will be visitor parking that will include uh, electric car chargers. And we're preparing for the future, so we believe that um, conduit for each individual parking space will be run, uh, and those individuals can add um, electric car charges as, as necessary. Um, we have obtained historic preservation approval. Uh, final approval um, was granted on January 10th, and um, HPC was incredibly easy to work with for they knew what was at stake um, with the ability to turn it, it from a mansion and repurpose it into a multifamily building. Again, some of the elevations are um, parts of the slides and so forth, and they're outside um, on, the, on the board. And um, it's been a very, very difficult process to <laughs> build the interior. The exterior is relatively easy because it is what it is. But the interior, I've, I found the word, <laughs> I didn't know what the word meant until someone mentioned that the third floor looked like a rabbit warren. And so we changed the design. I, um, I put my foot down and I said, I, I can't sell this. No one would want to live in this comfortably. And um, we, um, we've turned more or less the entire mansion into uh, duplexes. And the duplexes allow two things. One, um, separate living space from the main bedroom space, but it also allows enough space to create a um, secondary bedroom on the living space, which allows you ostensibly to, to, to grow old gracefully. You can live in this space until you're 95 uh, <laughs> if you want to, and uh, maybe even longer. Um, and the, the fact is we're, we're needing to turn the building into something that is incredibly um, safe, if you will. So that's why there's going to be two internal staircases that are code compliant. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a sprinkler fire suppression system. We mentioned the elevator. We've talked about the soundproofing between the spaces. Um, the, um, the site has been a very difficult um, challenge. I mean, we have a site plan that uh, is slide number nine. Um, I numbered them, yes, good. And um, it, it, it's a challenge because of the various departments that have said, well, by the way, you have to redo the loop road. It, the radius for turning a fire truck isn't, isn't appropriate. Um, and we inherited a few different plans from parks, from some of the various other um, renditions, if you will. And we've merged all of that into, I think, something fairly creative. And again, we'll allow the park to be used entirely as it is currently being used for. Um, you know, I work closely with uh, Adi Nair. He's a civil engineer. Um, he's been in, w in my firm for seven years, and he's you know chomping at the bit to get started with the project. Um, and uh, we. Um, have also been awarded a few different historical, um, uh, if you will, um, awards, sorry, for the uh, gymnasium work that we did, uh, which we still manage, uh, year number eight. And, you know, the reality with managing a building for an extended period of time is, you know, seeing you're the builder, you know exactly what needs to be done to maintain the building, and also to keep the condo fees where they should be and you know, not raising them because of issues that you could have maintained. And um, that's one of the reasons why I think I'm here, is because this is self-sustaining, this project. And because of some of my previous um, experiences with uh, Montgomery County and the uh, HPC tax credits, 50% of the tax credit uh, that we will be receiving for the historic work will be put back into the reserve. So at the end of year five, there will be approximately half a million dollars to move this project forward for the next 50 years. So there won't be any issue with replacement or things that um, you know should be replaced, but we don't have the money for. Um, we have some amazing local partners. I mean, we have Bill Morris of uh, Morris Architects. They're located in Gaithersburg. 
Um, I've known Bill and Paula for many years. Um, we've, we have the design tech uh, folks doing the mechanical engineering. They're from Kensington. Um, we obviously have parks. They're located in Wheaton. But you know, we, 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 we speak once or twice a week as we move this forward. And probably there was 300 items that needed to be taken care of approximately a year ago. And there was a contract signed a year ago, uh, but there were some amendments to it, changes, uh, specifically the site plan. And that has uh, f forced us to create an a, a, a amended contract, and uh, it's, it's, it's moving forward. Um, you know, we're, we're, people ask, well, you know, what, what, are you, what are you leaving behind? Again, what we're leaving behind is this amazing exterior of, of a building that looks almost identical to what it does today. Um, if we move to slide number 17, I know we're jumping around. Um, I think we've talked about some of the construction timelines and timelines themselves. But, you know, we, we, you want to think in best practice so it lasts the 50 to 100 years. I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're the details are on the plans and um, we're making sure that uh, the assemblies are appropriate for the climate zones. We're um, making sure that the place is ventilated uh, correctly. We uh, aren't going to be using gas, for instance. It's a full electric building. Uh, we will be conditioning basements and attic space as if they're living space. So, you know, there's no moisture buildup and such that occurs if uh, that's the case. Our, our best practices mainly come from fine home building, uh, a magazine that we, we read and we make sure that we're, we're learning from uh, new, new innovative design. Um, the siding is to be vented, so if any water ever gets behind the siding, it runs straight down to the ground. Uh, if it ever gets through the, the, the Brillo pad-ish material that you will never see that's behind the siding, uh, the building will be um, will be sealed and be air airtight as well. Um, healthy air quality is very important nowadays to people, uh, including um, you know the, the 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 people that have radon issues uh, or properties that have radon issues. So th there will be radon mitigation. We we mentioned the uh, rainwater management. So as if the building isn't there is really what. Um, the civil engineers come down on, that the water isn't being sh pushed into the Potomac, for instance. Um, we've talked about some of the different, uh, and I, I'm not really following along with the slides, but if you move to slide 20, thank you. Um, and it's the, it is the uh, plan that uh, it is at uh, the Department of uh, Permitting Services, and it shows the right width of corridors, uh, you know, it's very well dimensioned. Uh, I brought uh, Rick Taylor in of, um, of Chevy Chase Architects, who I believe is one of the more thoughtful architects I've ever met, to kind of get rid of the uh, rabbit warren that the third floor became. And um, so you'll notice there's staircases between the lower level and the upper level um, of the basement and first floor, and then there's a so there are duplexes on the second and third floor. Maybe go to the next couple of slides. You'll notice the large lobby in the center. Um, unbelievably so, there's 12 different window types on one elevation. Um, and that's you know due to the multiple owners and the various um, uh, architectural styles that they had when they were putting windows in. Most of the windows which uh, are part of the elevation slides are two over one. We are going to save all of the large windows that are part of the lobby. We don't need them to open. Um, and those are uh, historical windows. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, let's see, what else can I tell you? We haven't mentioned the carriage house. Um, it is an incredible little building. Um, the servants uh, lived over the garage for an extended period of time. And that will be turned into a duplex as well. Again, these aren't really universal because there are stairs in them, but they are really, really neat. Um, and the lower level on the right-hand side uh, will be a fitness center. And hopefully some of you will uh, be uh, friendly with the other folks that live there so you can use the fitness center as well. And um, 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm open to any questions um, if uh, you guys have them. Okay, well, thank you, panel. Um, you know, we all now know Warner Circle, right? The other thing that really strikes me about this process, you think about the decades of time and the thousands of hours put in by dedicated volunteers, our county who, you know, couldn't give us better responsiveness, I think, and how patient is the developer and the um, years that he's had to put in this project. It's an amazing case study about how a town, a community, individuals, nonprofit organizations dedicated to preservation and the private sector come together. So kudos to everybody who had a part in that. We're gonna take some questions because we'd like to have them mic'd. I'm gonna to try to come around and get the mic to people. So if you have a question, raise your hand. I will come to you. Hi, so thank you so much. I just wanna say we live literally right across the street from the property. And I just wanna ditto what you said. Thank you to everybody who's worked so hard and we're very excited to see life coming back into the building. We moved in in 1992 or three into our house, so we're excited about this. My one question is, you're responsible for the property for the next five years. What happens after that to the $500,000? Who's managing that? When it, who takes over managing the overall property once you're not doing that anymore? Yeah, that would be a minimum of five years, for starters. Okay. Uh, secondly, uh, there would be a property management company at some point who would be um, handling the actual management, but there will be a condo board of the 15 homeowners, three of those people would be on the board. Um, and they would be responsible for hiring the property management team um, and coordinating issues with anyone who has a problem with the uh, residents. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Carl. Uh, you mentioned the timeline, but I apologize. I missed what you mean by that. Like, when do you start f construction and when do you finish? Yeah, yeah, no, great, great question. I mean, we, as we now know, we have a signed amended contract, um, and that was 10 days ago. Um, and uh, we currently have a permit in at DPS, and I think it has been pre approved. Um, and we're hoping to get started sooner than later. And, um, you know, we're waiting on some land condo docks. You, you heard that we um, consolidated 17 lots into one single one. So there needs to be a meets and bounds survey done, which doesn't take very long, but <laughs> we need to know where the bounds are. And so we need the site plan um, and the stormwater management plan to be approved 100%. Um, We've been through 10, approximately 10 renditions of the site plan, and we're hoping that the last one that is at the um, DPS desk is the, is the, is the winner. Uh, and we've had multiple reviews, and granted, one could be upset that the review is a different review from the previous review, but it's all for a good reason. And instead of you know 10 conditions, there's maybe three conditions, but we're, very, very close, and um, there obviously will need to be a, a settlement and um, the purchase of the property, and then we'll be starting. But my timeline, which is here, is um, more or less uh, starting within the next 30 days, if I have my way. Yeah, so it's a great question, because some of the people that uh, have sent in the <coughs> non-binding reservation agreements, and they're, they're non-binding. Um, they've sold their homes. So we need to push this, and uh, we believe that um, between August, if we can start in April, we'll be finished in August slash September of next year. So 15 months, yeah. Uh, um, of the 15 units, Couple things. Um, what are the prices for them, and are any of them set aside for moderately priced dwelling units or yeah, no, uh, these low are cost? All, these are all great questions. I mean, the, the, the reality is, I mean, I'm not really here to sell the units. Um, the, there, there are some 
relatively um, succinct numbers in square foot that are part of the QR code, and you could look at that a little more closely. Uh, this is not moderate income housing, unfortunately. I, I've built community housing in the past, and I'm proud of that. But you know, the reality is this is a for-profit venture, and you know, we are putting $750,000 of our own money into spaces, the Stone Terrace, the community center, the bathrooms, the um, various um, um, fire hydrants that need to be added, and creating a park that's going to last for a, an extended period of time. So in the sense of the, um, uh, you, you could use the phrase, in-kind contribution back to the taxpayers, uh, we, we are on uh, record as putting $750,000 into the uh, spaces that I just mentioned. Thank you. Well, I think it's a credit to the panel that we've Oh, I was, I was just going to follow up on the MPDU issue. Um, it's all determined by the county zoning code when MPDUs are required. I, I believe at a minimum it has to be 20 units or more. And it may, and, and different zones have different, but the absolute lowest is 20. So this is only 15 MPDUs are not a requirement. Thanks for the clarification. Um, doesn't appear like there's any more questions, and I think that's a credit to our panel because they covered it thoroughly. I just want to point out that we had another 50 people in on Zoom with us, so good turnout. Probably one of our better attended uh, hybrid Zoom in-person things. So uh, wrap it up, and the good news is there's wine, cheese, crackers, and other munchies out there. Hopefully our panel can hang around for a moment or two, and we've got some display boards out there if you haven't seen them. So thank you for coming, and look forward to seeing you next time.